Welcome to Tech Topics brought to you by Cybervenger. We help keep small businesses stay protected and compliant with cutting-edge cybersecurity and IT solutions. Hello and welcome back. My name is Andy. I'm the Managing Consultant for Cybervenger. Today's another deep dive into the 110 controls of the NIST 800-171 standard. For those that don't know, that standard is it asked, is required by anyone who is participating in the Department of Defense supply chain ecosystem. So if you make a battery cable for an Abrams tank or a part of a battery cable, this standard applies to you and you've got to follow it or you won't win any bids for federal contracts. You won't win any bids for contracts with suppliers that make the entire battery cable, so on and so forth. Anyway, today's control is 3.1.15, which if we uh, look down at our statement here, it says... Authorize remote execution of privileged commands and remote access to security-relevant information. Wow, what a whole lot of nothing, right? <laughs> it's just kind of a word salad. It took me a while to get my head around it. And what feels so wrong about this thing is like, didn't we already cover this? It feels kind of redundant. Like, we already talked about in previous controls that if you're being remote, if you're accessing the system remotely, you need to be authorized. Not just anyone should be able to remote in. And we also said that, hey, if you're going to be doing privileged commands, not just anybody should do that either. You, you should be authorized to be an admin to do, you know, formatting the hard drive or adding new drivers or installing software or admin-like stuff. And that makes sense, too. That's pretty simple. Kind of covers this, doesn't it? No, this rule joins the two. Just because you're an administrator, you have administrative rights on an account, doesn't mean you should be able to do these things remotely. Maybe there's certain commands that you should be able to do, and maybe there's certain people that should be able to be remote, but maybe not do those certain commands while remote. Let's say, for example, backups. Let's say you have a problem with your backup system and you want to format your drive and start over and rebuild, right? That could be a very dangerous command because backups, as we talked about in other videos on this channel, are the number one target, like the number one thing that the bad guys are going after. You have to protect your backups. So... Why would you want to troubleshoot your backups like that? It's not the kind of thing you do all the time. So maybe you restrict access to being able to delete or, you know, format backups or modify your attention to only when you're on site because it's much, much harder to fake being an authorized person on site in the building. We have to go past checkpoints and swipe security cards and we have hide to people. It's a lot bigger challenge than sitting from a desk in another country just banging away at the keyboard. So you can just it's a, it's a simple example, not necessarily that, but there can be commands and functions that you may want to reserve to only doing well in-house, under your own roof by certain people. Privileged commands can't be done remotely unless you have a good justification for it. What do you really need to do as a system administrator remotely? It's a question you need to ask. The standard doesn't say specifically. It gives you some freedom and some flexibility, fortunately, right? I mean, this <laughs> this requirement could be a lot of trouble. Well, you know, I got to support my systems remotely. I got to reboot if something goes wrong, right? What if they couldn't do that? Well, that's up to you to how much you want to do, what you want to say you can and can't. Again, though, since it's calling it out, this idea out specifically in this 3.1.15, you need to have a written policy that addresses this, that says, hey, these are the kinds of things we're going to let administrators do remotely, and these are the kinds of things that we're not, and here's our justification. And then whatever you write down in your policy, you got to actually do. It's a very important concept. Say what you're going to do, do what you're saying. It's uh, a key idea between any kind of compliance, specifically, of course, and particularly 800-171. So that's what this control is about. It sounds very redundant, but it's not It's not splitting hairs. It's just when you have standards like this, you really got to call out the exact specific details. It's a little bit like programming. For any of those who have ever tried programming, the program's not going to do what you want. It's going to do what you tell it to do <laughs> or, and not do what you don't tell it to do. you got to be very specific steps, and that's how these standards are. They're written to cover for every little little thing. So... That's it in a nutshell, and uh, I'm Andy with CyberVenger. This has been another NIST 800-171 deep drive, and I hope you're enjoying this, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. We hope this video has provided valuable information to you. Be sure to share this video with other small business owners to spread the word about the importance of cybersecurity. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe for more videos like this. If you want more information about cybersecurity visit us at www.cyberventure.com